Hi, this is Seth Cohen from the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the University of Washington, and we're going to be talking about urinary tract infections. The learning objectives include understand the pathogenesis and classification of UTIs, differentiate UTIs from asymptomatic bacteriuria, and describe first-line treatment options for UTIs. An anatomical framework is helpful to think about urinary tract infections. We often divide them into the lower urinary tract, which includes cystitis, or a bladder infection, urethritis, which is commonly caused by sexually transmitted infections and is discussed elsewhere, and asymptomatic bacteriuria, which is not technically an infection, but an important clinical scenario that often arises and is worth knowing about. The upper urinary tract consists principally of the kidneys, an infection of which is called pyelonephritis, aka pylo. As you may know, UTIs are more common in women. Men tend to be protected due to longer urethras and antimicrobial prostatic secretions. Other important risk factors include recent intercourse, a history of urinary tract infections, diabetes, prostatic hypertrophy, or BPH, and congenital urinary tract abnormalities. Not mentioned here, but also important, are indwelling urinary or bladder catheters, which are common in the hospital, and greatly increase your risk of a hospital-acquired urinary tract infection. The pathogenesis of UTI starts with colonization with uropathogens, which are typically fecal flora near the urethra. Uropathogens simply mean bacteria that have a predisposition or predilection for attaching to the urinary epithelium. Bacteria can enter the bladder following intercourse, but are usually washed away by urination and host defenses. Fecal flora that are remaining will ascend into the bladder and can continue up to the ureters and into the kidneys. Of note, pylo can also result from bacterial seeding of the kidneys during bacteremia or bloodstream infections. This is one mechanism whereby Staph aureus can cause pyelonephritis or descending infections of the urinary tract. Note that we don't typically think of Staph aureus as a uropathogen in the sense that it ascends from below. Another framework for thinking about urinary tract infections is whether they're complicated or uncomplicated. Uncomplicated means that the patient is a non-pregnant, outpatient woman without additional risk factors, such as anatomic abnormalities or urinary tract instrumentation. By contrast, complicated urinary tract infections means the patient is more likely to fail therapy. By definition, these include any woman who's pregnant, any man with a urinary tract infection, patients with diabetes, patients whose urinary tracts have undergone instrumentation, such as a urologic procedure or transplant, anatomic abnormalities, and immunosuppression. The microbiology of uncomplicated UTIs typically includes enteric gram-negative rods, the vast majority of which are E. coli. Others include Proteus and Klebsiella, in addition to other enterics. Of note, Staphylococcus saprophyticus is a gram-positive that can affect healthy young women. In contrast, Staph aureus is not considered a uropathogen, as mentioned previously, but can cause urinary tract infections in the setting of instrumentation or genitourinary procedures. Isolation of Staph aureus in the urine should make you wonder about hematogenous seeding of the genitourinary tract. Other organisms are unusual outside of catheter-associated UTIs, instrumentation, and immunosuppression. Clinical manifestations of cystitis include urinary frequency, dysuria, hematuria, and suprapubic pain. Pyelonephritis can include those symptoms in addition to having fever, costovertebral angle tenderness, vomiting, flank pain, and delirium. The costovertebral angle is pictured at the right, and on exam you can elicit CVA tenderness by tapping your fist in that area uh, to uh, elicit tenderness on exam. The diagnosis consists of laboratory criteria plus clinical symptoms. Laboratory criteria on their own are insufficient to make the diagnosis. The urinalysis is probably the most important test, and pyuria, which is white blood cells in the urine, is the most sensitive part of the urinalysis. Note that this is not specific, and there are other conditions that can cause pyuria, other than urinary tract infections. Leukocytesterase is commercially available on dipsticks and measures an enzyme released by white blood cells. Note that this is a surrogate marker for pyuria, and thus is less sensitive and specific than pyuria itself.
Nitrites is also available on dipsticks and measures the conversion of nitrate to nitrite and is a good test for high amounts of Enterobacteriaceae. Urine culture is not necessary for healthy women and many outpatients, as many urinary tract infections can be treated presumptively. However, cultures are indicated if clinical characteristics are atypical, if there's a complicated infection, if you suspect unusual resistance patterns, or if there's treatment failure. Please note that the specificity of all of the above is highly uh, subject to the degree of contamination, and that skin flora can cause false positive urine cultures, as well as pyuria, false positive leukocytesterase, and nitrites. Asymptomatic bacteriuria is defined as a positive urine culture in the absence of symptoms. This just means that patients have bacteria swimming in their urine, and it may not be causing infection. It's common in hospitalized patients, as well as those with indwelling urinary catheters. Transient bacteriuria is also not uncommon among healthy women. Please note that asymptomatic bacteriuria is treated only under specific circumstances. These include pregnancy and prior to any urologic procedure with a high bleeding risk. There are three first-line antibiotics for the treatment of uncomplicated urinary tract infections. The first is nitrofurantoin, also known as macrobid. This is an excellent first-line drug for lower urinary tract infections. Unfortunately, this is contraindicated uh, for a GFR uh, less than 60 or patients with chronic kidney disease. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, also known as Septra or Bactrim, is also an excellent first-line antibiotic. Side effects include rash, renal failure, and there's also an association with Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Phosphomycin is a less commonly used but first-line antibiotic for lower urinary tract infections. Please note that quinolones, particularly ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin, are not first-line antibiotics, can be, but can be used as an alternative when first-line antibiotics are contraindicated. Quinolones can be used uh, and are an excellent option for outpatient pyelonephritis. Thanks so much for listening.